Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, coming to you today from Washington. And joining us now from Salt Lake City, Utah, is Min Chi Lee. He teaches economics at the University of Utah. Thanks for joining us, Min Chi. Thank you, Paul. So you're an economist, you deal with data. Has any of the emails that have been revealed that were either hacked or whistleblown released, we don't know yet, at the uh, East Anglia University being called Climate Gate that's supposed to throw doubt on the issue of climate change science, has it shaken or in any way affected the way you look at this issue? Well, over the weekend, there was an open letter by more than 20 leading scientists in this country. They wrote to Congress and pointing out that this so-called climate gate does not in any way uh, undermine the underlying scientific evidence behind the argument for climate change. And we know that the existing argument for climate change does not derive from a few single scientists, but instead it's the outcome of research from tens of thousands of scientists uh, from all over the world. So this email thing does not in any way undermine this scientific evidence. And do, do the majority of Chinese scientists uh, agree with the idea of man-made climate change? I think, yeah, including the majority of the Chinese scientists, yes. So let's, let's talk about Copenhagen. If, in fact, most of the scientific community is quite persuaded in the climate change science, and certainly they are, and, and Copenhagen, all the world governments say they are, what's preventing us from getting a serious agreement, and particularly with China and the United States, coming to something real? I think the situation, in, in fact, right now is uh, not good. And we all know that now it's uh, almost for sure there will not be a le legally binding agreement in Copenhagen. And uh, I think the underlying problem is that uh, despite all the talk, rhetoric about effort to uh, contribute to climate stabilization, and all of these governments primarily concerned with economic growth, or in other words, capitalist accumulation. And uh, so they are afraid of uh, this climate stabilizing effort will increase the cost for capitalist accumulation, reducing capitalist profit, and therefore they are not really doing serious, uh, serious, uh, making serious effort. Doesn't China and India have a legitimate argument that the West has had more than a hundred years of economic development and, and carbon emissions, and China and India are just trying to catch up, and there doesn't, there can't be anything but a disproportionate uh, share of the effects of this or it's unfair. I think that's a very legitimate argument. And of course, and China and India can only bear the fair share of their global obligation. But nonetheless, they have to undertake the global obligation. Uh, the basic fact is that China has already overtaken the US to become the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And even in terms of per capita average, I suppose right now China's per capita average is already above the world per capita average, even though it's still far below the American one. And so uh, China needs to uh, undertake at least as much in average as the, rest, as the rest of the world to reduce emissions. I mean, I mean, isn't that a point that, it, that whatever the historical point of all this is, the current carbon emission is such that China has, I guess, now just surpassed the U.S., but it won't be long before China starts to pull away even from the U.S. Is that true? I think yeah, that's true. And uh, of course, the situation right now is uh, because we have accumulated emissions so rapidly and people have been talking about that it's necessary to prevent global warming by two degrees to avoid the uh, uh, climate catastrophes. But we have been accumulating emissions so rapidly. So now two degrees is increasingly unlikely. There was even one report from one of the, I think, a subcommittee of the IPCC that said even six degrees is not out of the question by the end of the century. Right, yeah, and uh, there is a, a new research report uh, by a, a European organization, it's called ECOFIS, and in their climate action tracker, and they believe that given all the promises from all the governments, if they fulfill all of these uh, promises, we would still be looking forward to something like 3.5 degree warming. Is the real truth here, the truth that no one wants to speak, that the more developed countries have decided they can live with the consequences of, of climate change and that the poorer countries that are going to get hit more quickly and worse, uh, too bad. I mean, there seems to be no real sense of urgency on the part of the, the more developed countries, including China and India. Well, unfortunately, that might be the case. Well, if you accept the science and you accept 
the, the idea that we're facing, a, at least much, many of us humans are facing a catastrophe, you'd think there'd be much more sense of urgency. If there was some meteor about to hit the earth, and we knew it was going to hit within a year or five years or ten years, and blow us to smithereens, people would be trying to do something about it. But the climate change crisis, even though there's some rhetoric about it, it's not really being dealt with. It. In fact, if anything, it's being looked at as a way to make money. You know, cap and trade schemes and other kinds of ways. It seems more, how can we cash in on other people's sense of urgency rather than us really having a sense of urgency ourselves? Well, that's uh, very unfortunate. I mean, the thing is that uh, if the things continue to develop in this way, eventually it will not only be the poor countries that suffer from this, it will be the entire world. But the problem is that under the existing world system, and of course it's dominated by capitalist corporations who only think about near-term profit. Now there seems to be, there's a section of, of these corporations that say they are serious about it. Uh, partly because there's money to be made in it. This is part of what strengthens the skeptic argument, is that so many of the schemes to do something about the climate change seem to be new kinds of Ponzi schemes, like cap and trade. Uh, how do people separate you know, what they call uh, corporate greenwashing versus real climate change efforts? Well, the real climate change, that is uh we all know that it's supported by the scientific argument and the, the global warming is happening and if it's not stopped, yet will lead to uh, climate catastrophes. And that will not, this fact will not change. Uh, it does not matter if we live under capitalist system, capitalist system or any other system, this fact will not change. And on the other hand, since we right now still live in the capital system, uh, unfortunately, and uh, the climate stabilization effort is taking place within this general framework of capitalism, which is therefore interacted with all of these profit motives. And but since we have this system of profit motive, this effort to achieve climate stabilization probably will not succeed. That is the system we're in, and it doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime uh, soon. Certainly not soon enough if, if the time frame of climate change that scientists are telling us is the correct time frame. In terms of Copenhagen, in terms of international agreements, in terms of what people should be demanding from their politicians, how do they sort out what looks like real measures? Like you have, for example, you have cap and trade, you have carbon tax, you have the issue of regulation. It's a very confusing debate for most ordinary people. What is real meaningful change or, or uh, policy to you? Well, it's a... Uh... Uh, of course, given the current situation, the world's majority of the environmental movements continue to follow the strategy uh, to persuade the government to reform, uh, to adopt certain measures within the capital system, like capital trade, or some would propose carbon tax as an alternative. Uh, but uh, the situation, the reality we are observing as right now is that no matter how hard we are pressing the capitalist government, no matter how hard we are pressing the corporations, the reality is that the emissions keep uh, growing each year, uh, except for the uh, uh, this year because of a very deep uh, recession, but we cannot have recession, uh, deep recession every year. And then the basic uh, situation is that if these uh, capital countries continue to expand the emissions and there's no way to get out. And so I would say maybe it's time for the environmental movements to look beyond themselves and to find ways to combine their effort with the effort of the general social movement, to combine their effort with the effort of the world's uh, great majority, the oppressed and exploited, and only with the general participation of the greater majority of the world population, then we have some hope to stop this. I know this is hard, but I don't see any other option. Now, in terms of the thinking of the Chinese, I mean, the Chinese do think, we're told, longer term than, than the American corporate elite. Um, if the Chinese are taking this seriously, then don't they see in their own long-term interest that this has to be faced up to? Well, if the Chinese people right now, uh, yes, actually in charge of their political and economic system, and, and I suppose we can have a reasoned argument about this. But of course, right now, uh, the Chinese uh, political power is in the hands of bureaucratic capitalist elites, and who uh, basically only care about their own power and profits, and of course, under the pressure of public opinion, they need to make some gesture. 
and they need to have some nice rhetoric, but that has not translated into real, really serious action. Now, we're told that China is ahead of the United States in terms of the development of alternative energy. They're ahead, they're actually growing in terms of some of the regulation on carbon emission as a whole, although coal apparently is, is still expanding very quickly. Um, very quickly. I mean, do they have a, a plan for this or not? Well, Chinese government uh, just made the commitment to reduce the so-called carbon intensity of GDP by 40 to 45 percent by 2020 from 2005 levels. Now, uh, that sounds a very large number, but uh, this carbon intensity is not the same thing as carbon emissions. The carbon intensity is about the ratio uh, of emissions to GDP. So it's quite possible for China to reduce carbon intensity but in the meantime, increasing China's absolute emission levels. And in fact, given the Chinese government's current promise, and if we assume the Chinese economy continue to grow, let's say 10% a year, then the Chinese government promise is quite compatible with a doubling of the absolute level of emissions from 2005 to 2020. Here in North America, we have the impression at least that Europe is more serious about all of this. Uh, apparently, they are going to meet the Kyoto uh, Agreement. And there, there's even talk that Europe might put some trade barriers against uh, importers who don't meet certain uh, climate change targets, uh, carbon emission targets. Uh, now, you have a capitalist system in Europe, as you do in the other places. What, is, it, is it true that Europe is ahead on this? And if so, what? Well, Europe is definitely one step ahead of the U.S., but only one step ahead. And we need many steps ahead for the whole world. But Europe does seem to be taking it more seriously. I mean, there is a point, even within a capitalist structure, where at least enough or a significant section of the corporate sector is going to realize this is not in their interest. You can already see it amongst insurance companies who are very concerned about what, what kind of, how this is going to affect uh, house and building insurance. Uh, so, so the, it's not monolithic where the interests lie within, within the system. Uh, is it not possible at some point, uh, and, and maybe soon, sections of this corporate elite are going to find out that their own interest, even short-term interests, are affected by all of this? Well, one of the underlying dilemma is that much of the catastrophe, let's say, uh, that would result from global warming will not happen maybe at least uh, 20 years from now. And on the other hand, of course, most of the capitalists would only care about competition in today's world. And of course, there are some sections uh, of capitalist class that are somewhat more enthusiastic about climate stabilization than other sections. Uh, but overall, those sections that uh, are the same uh, sections of capitalist class that are supporting all of these climate uh, skeptics uh, remain relatively strong. And on the other hand, you have this competition between different capitalist classes, comp competition between different capital states. So none of them want to increase the cost for themselves. And so we live in this huge dilemma. Well, which is why they want an international agreement. I mean, in theory, it, you've heard, used to hear this from the uh, automobile con uh, companies. Uh, they used to say, we don't mind having controls. It just has to be an equal playing field. Like every auto company has to come under the same set of rules, and then we can play within those rules. Is that not true in terms of global competition? If you really could have a global agreement, then everyone competitively is more or less in the same position. Ideally, that is the case. But the problem with the international agreement is that, of course, first of all, what kind of agreement and what is in it for everyone? And secondly, and how do you enforce the agreement? Well, I suppose the same way they, they try to enforce world trade agreements. There has to be right. sanctions uh, and, and various things. Uh, it all comes down to, again, is whether these elites actually, if they really believe the science or not. Right. Maybe that's why that uh, China, India, uh, South Africa, Brazil are now resisting any kind of uh, legally binding commitment. Uh, on the other hand, the Western powers can no longer run the world as they used to run the world. Thanks very much for joining us, Minchi. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.